Welcome to the Daisy Bill webinar on mastering the original bill for California Workers' Comp. This webinar is the second in our Workers' Comp 101 series. The first webinar, Must Know Basics, gave a comprehensive overview of how the work comp system works in California. If you didn't attend that webinar, I urge you to watch the recording as it's a great framework for all the other webinars in this series. The video is available for free in our webinar library. This webinar starts on the part of the 101 series that traces the bill life cycle, beginning with today's webinar on original bill submissions. The next webinar covers EORs and payments. Webinar number four focuses on requests for second review appeals, while webinar number five covers independent bill review. Leaving the bill life cycle, webinar number six looks at penalties and interest. Webinar number seven will be devoted to requests for authorization and the complexities of the so-called automatic authorization process. Finally, in January, the series will end with our ever-popular annual OMFS webinar, where we'll review changes to the various fee schedules for 2019 dates of service. A little about us. DaisyBill makes smart billing software to help people manage the complexities of workers' comp billing and payment. Workers' comp is challenging, and our software is designed to make workers' comp easier. We offer three software solutions. First is a complete end-to-end -end revenue cycle management system that electronically submits and tracks workers' comp bills. DaisyBill electronically submits the CMS 1500 and UBO4 forms, as well as the NCPDP form for pharmacy billing. We also electronically transmit medical legal bills as well as interpreter bills and copy service bills. For all bills, Daisy Bill automatically completes the second bill review form and sends these appeals electronically as well. This table represents the average days to payment for our top 10 largest claims administrators by volume of bills for the past 12 months. Because Daisy Bill electronically submits bills directly to all clearinghouses, most payers on average send payment to Daisy Billers well within the required 15 working days. Some of these large payers, on average, submit payment to Daisy Bill clients in 10 days or less. Bottom line is, when done correctly, workers' comp electronic billing works. For those who don't need the full scope of our billing software, we have the work comp wizard. The wizard includes seven critical features to help California workers' comp professionals succeed. The wizard features the very popular OMFS calculator which instantly calculates reimbursements for six medical fee schedules, as well as the medical legal fee schedule. Finally, we offer our Essential Tools. Essential Tools subscribers can create second review appeals and requests for authorizations in seconds, and use our task management system to track payer responses to RFAs and SBRs. Let's start this webinar on the original bill with some context. In California, there are two types of medical-related services for workers' comp, healthcare services and medical legal services. The labor code, regulations, and rules differ for these two types of services. This 101 series deals with bills for healthcare services. We will not cover medical legal services. For in-depth information on medical legal billing, go to our webinar library and check out this year's earlier webinar featuring the med legal expert, Sue Honor. Don't worry about taking notes today because after the webinar, we'll send out an email with the slides and a recording of the video. To start, Labor Code 4600 requires the employer to pay for all medical services as, quote, reasonably needed to cure or relieve the injured worker from the effects of his or her injury, end quote. Here is a list of medical services included in Labor Code 4600. At the bottom, we added interpreter services. In a recent lawsuit, the DIR issued a brief in which the DIR designated interpreter services as medical treatment services when the interpreter provides their services during medical treatment. If you are interested in the lawsuit details, you can watch our free webinar on lien declaration requirements where we discuss interpreters. As we introduced in part one of this webinar series, this medical billing and payment guide from the DWC specifies the billing and payment rules for healthcare bills. 
The original bill is the first bill for services sent by a provider to the claims administrator. The DWC guide directs providers to submit a complete bill. The DWC does not consider a bill complete unless it consists of all four parts listed here. First, the DWC requires a provider to use the correct designated form. Second, a complete bill requires correct billing codes. Third, the designated form must be filled out correctly. And fourth, a complete bill must include the required workers' comp reports. Let's start by looking at the correct designated billing forms. As we move through the webinar, this roadmap will show where we are in the presentation. Labor Code 4603.4 requires healthcare providers to submit medical bills for payment on standardized forms. As we explained in our first webinar, the Division of Workers' Comp is charged with creating regulations and rules to implement the requirements of the labor codes. The DWC regulations include the California DWC Medical Billing and Payment Guide, which we'll refer to extensively throughout this webinar. This DWC guide, in Section 2.0, directs that all medical bills shall be submitted on the uniform billing forms, and this section lists the required billing form for each type of healthcare service. For electronic billing, which claims administrators must accept, there is a separate set of required electronic formats. We have a whole webinar on this topic, which is available from our webinar library. For paper billing, healthcare providers must submit bills using the CMS 1500. The CMS.gov website lists all the CMS forms. For the CMS 1500, use the search term 1500 in the filter box. Institutional bills must be submitted using the UB04 form. Use the search term UB04 on the CMS.gov website. A dentist must use the American Dental Association dental claim form. This form can be purchased from the ADA store. Last, a pharmacy must use the NCPDP WCPC claim form. This form can be purchased on the website with the horrible web address. Just Google NCPDP work comp form or copy and paste the address once you receive our slides. The second billing requirement of a complete bill is the use of correct billing codes. We'll go through some of the billing codes listed in this section. Correct billing codes, for the most part, means using codes from the DWC's Official Medical Fee Schedule, or OMFS. The DWC maintains a website which lists relevant information about the seven separate fee schedules. However, there are also three fee schedules that are not part of the OMFS. The copy service fee schedule became effective for all dates of service on or after July 1, 2015 and applies to all copy services. Now here's an important point about copy services. There is no simple table where you can just look at the copy fees. Instead, you have to go to the right regulations and read through them for billing rules, allowable codes, and associated fees. Specifically, you must reference CCR section 9981, or you can subscribe to the OMFS wizard. The OMFS calculator in the wizard includes all of the copy service codes and updated reimbursement amounts. There is also a separate interpreter's fee schedule that is not part of the OMFS. Interpreters don't even get their own DWC webpage. Just go straight to CCR 9795.3. As mentioned earlier, there's a separate medical legal fee schedule that determines reimbursement for medical legal evaluations and testimony. This medical legal fee schedule is not part of the OMFS either. There, this is the website where you can access the medical legal fee schedule regulations. However, when a medical legal evaluation requires medical services, the reimbursement for the medical services is determined by the OMFS. For more on this, refer to the MedLegal webinar I mentioned earlier, 
which is available in our webinar library. Now for the seven OMFS fee schedules. Using the ambulance fee schedule as an example, I'll sketch out the process to determine the correct reimbursement. The orders of the administrative director alert you to the most recent updates to the fee schedule. The regulations related to the fee schedule are also listed. If the DWC has adopted reference material, these adopted files are also listed, some of which have links of their own that you must follow. You will sometimes need to be part lawyer and part detective and use all the resources listed under the fee schedule to piece together exactly how to bill and pay for services. This process needs to be followed for each of the other fee schedules. In January, we will host the last webinar in this series, and the webinar will examine in great detail the five OMFS fee schedules listed here. After correct form and correct codes, the next requirement of a complete bill is that the provider must correctly fill out the designated form as directed by the DWC rules. Now we'll go through the different types of information that must populate the various forms. First, the DWC guide specifies that all information on paper submission of original bills must be typewritten. For each bill type, Appendix A of the DWC guide lists the information which is required, optional, and situational when filling out the bill form. We'll go through the DWC instructions for three forms, the CMS 1500, the UBO 4, and the NC PDP form. Because so few of you use the ADA dental form, we're not going to review that form. Let's start with properly completing the CMS 1500 form. The DWC requires five patient demographics, patient name, gender, date of birth, social security number, and patient address. In the DWC guide, append in the, excuse me, in the DWC guide appendix, an R means the information is required. When filling out the CMS 1500, the DWC requires the injured worker social security number in box 1A. To repeat, the injured worker social security number is required when submitting a worker's comp bill. If the injured worker does not have a social security number, the guide instructs you to complete this box with nine nines. Using nine nines is only compliant when the patient genuinely does not possess a social security number, not when you simply don't know the social security number. The DWC requires three injury information fields, injury start date, employer's name, and the injury claim number. The DWC requires the employer's name in box four. An S means the information is situationally required. The DWC situationally requires employer's address only when the bill is both the first indication of work-related incident and the claim number is missing from box 11A. The claim number assigned to the injured worker's injury populates box 11B. The DWC instructions state, quote, required if known. Enter qualifier Y4 to the left of the vertical line and enter the worker's compensation claim number assigned by the claims administrator to the right of the vertical line, end quote. For unknown claim numbers, the DWC instructs, quote, if claim number is not known, then enter the value unknown to indicate unknown claim number, end quote. Per the DWC instructions, quote, this box requires one of the above values and cannot be left blank or may result in the bill being rejected, end quote. So to be clear here, the claim number box cannot be left blank, even if you have to enter the value unknown. The DWC expects the date of injury in box 14. There are two types of injury a specific injury, and a cumulative injury. 
A specific injury occurs as the result of a single incident or exposure. An example of a specific injury is when a worker falls and injures their back. For a specific injury, you enter the actual date the injury occurred. A cumulative injury results from repetitive trauma, mental or physical, over a period of time. For example, a worker sustains a cumulative injury if they lift heavy objects regularly and as a result develop lower back pain that gets progressively worse. For a cumulative injury, you enter the start date of the cumulative trauma. Now let's move on to the required treatment information. At least one diagnosis code is required. For all dates of service on or after October 1st, 2015, the DWC expects ICD-10 diagnosis codes. The treatment information that typically populates a group health bill is also used in Box 24, Sections A through G. The DWC expects you to complete Box 23 with any authorization number you may receive from the Claims Administrator. If the rendering provider is a healthcare provider with an assigned taxonomy code, the ZZ qualifier must populate box 24J. DWC also requires the actual taxonomy code of the rendering provider in box 24J. The healthcare provider taxonomy code categorizes the type, classification, and or specialization of a healthcare provider. The DWC requires the rendering provider's NPI number in box 24J. This requirement only applies when the rendering provider is different than the provider listed in box 33 and the rendering provider qualifies for an NPI number. On the NPPES NPI registry website, you can apply and search for NPIs and you can also look up taxonomy codes. Because there is so much to cover today, we won't review boxes 32 and 33. They're both fairly well understood, but if you have any questions about these boxes, reach out to me directly. Now let's spend a few minutes discussing the UB04 form used for institutional billing. This form requires the same five patient demographics, including the patient social security number, the UB04 also requires providers to fill out the three injury information fields. For workers' comp, the DWC requires field 31 to be populated with the value 04 to indicate the bill is work-related. Also, the injury start date populates the date box. Field 18 is populated with condition code 02 to indicate that the condition is employment-related. Field 59 is populated with the number 20 to indicate the patient is an employee. Fields 58 and 65 are both populated with the name of the employer. Fields 8A and 60 are both populated with the patient's social security number. Finally, field 62 is populated with the patient's injury claim number assigned by the claims administrator. If you're billing using the UB04, make sure that your bill is filled out correctly with the required work-related information. Now let's spend a few minutes reviewing the DWC requirements for the NCPDP form for pharmacy services. The DWC requires pharmacies to submit bills using the NCPDP form. This form requires the same five patient demographics, including the patient social security number. The patient demographics populate the patient fields. Unlike the other forms, the DWC requires the employer's address. The employer's address populates the employer section. The DWC expects the prescribing provider information in the prescriber section. For dispense pharmaceuticals, fill out the claim section. 
For com compound pharmaceuticals, fill out the compound section. We just reviewed how to correctly complete the billing forms. As you can clearly see, the information required by the DWC is substantially different than the information required for group health or Medicare bills. When registering a patient with a new injury, Daisyville recommends using a special workers' comp intake form that collects the information required for a workers' comp bill. Your intake form should include the required patient demographics, including the patient's social security number. The claims administrator needs to provide you with all the patient demographic information. Next, the claims administrator needs to provide you with the required injury information necessary to complete the billing form. At the time of intake, Daisy Bill strongly suggests that you also obtain the additional optional information listed here. Helpful optional information includes the injured body part and a description of the injury. The employer or insurer MPN name is critical billing information the claims administrator should provide you. Daisy Billers, we added claim status as an injury field. To help with billing, we recommend obtaining this information and completing this field with the appropriate claim status. Finally, we recommend that you collect contact information for the adjuster, <clears throat> excuse me, and any nurse case managers and attorneys. Although not required, this information will save you time down the road. If your practice needs an intake form, the email that we send out after the webinar includes the link to the fillable PDF version of the patient intake form. It is important that you get this information from the claims administrator so that your information matches the information in the payer's system. In our last webinar, we reviewed the role of the claims administrator. Here's an important billing tip. If the employee sustains multiple work injuries that are unrelated, you must separately register each new injury. Each injury requires separate bills with different injury information. Here, Daisy Duck sustained an injury in 2015 while employed by Sapid Designs. Bills for this injury are sent to Liberty Mutual. Then poor Daisy sustained an injury in 2018 while employed by Duck Feed RS. Bills for this injury are sent to Gallagher Bassett. One last bill requirement is that original bills now have a deadline for submission. This timely bill submission applies to all dates of service on or after January 1, 2017. For these dates of service on or after January 1, 2017, the Labor Code requires providers to submit bills within 12 months of rendering services or 12 months from the date of discharge from an inpatient facility. Furthermore, and most importantly, Labor Code 4603.2 clearly instructs that no payment is due for untimely bill submission. Quote, the request for payment is barred unless timely submitted, end quote. This timely billing requirement applies to all providers of services, including physicians, hospitals, pharmacies, interpreters, copy services, transportation services, and home health services. We've now come to the fourth and final requirement of a complete bill, which is that a provider must include all of the DWC required reports with the bill. The DWC guide lists 12 billing circumstances when a provider must submit a separate report in order to receive payment for the services rendered. Given the importance of reporting in workers' comp, let's review these 12 instances when a report is required. Starting with the doctor's first report of occupational injury, which is submitted on the form DLSR 5021. The DWC regulations instructs a new primary treating physician to submit a form DLSR 5021 following the initial examination of an injured worker. This regulation requires each new primary treating physician to submit the form following the initial examination of an injured worker. Per regulation 9785, a primary treating physician 
shall complete and submit this form within five days of the initial examination of the injured worker. Emergency and urgent care physicians are also expected to submit the DLSR form following the initial visit at the treatment facility. For billing purposes, the doctor's first report is billed using the California Specific Code WC001. There is no reimbursement for completing and sending this form. The instructions on the DLSR form direct the physician to send two copies to the employer's insurance or directly to the ins insured employer. Unless you are confident that the employee has reported the injury to their employer by completing and submitting the DWC-1 form to the employer, you should avoid sending this form to the employer. Since this form contains protected health information, sending it to an employer if there is no workers' comp claim filed by the employee could be an unjustified disclosure of protected health information. The strict HIPAA privacy rule does not apply to, to a filed workers' comp claim. Specifically, it does not, quote, apply to entities that are either workers' compensation insurers, workers' compensation administrative agencies, or employers, end quote. Per the website of the Department of Health and Human Services, or HHS, quote, the privacy rule recognizes the legitimate need of insurers and other entities involved in the workers' compensation system to have access to individuals' health information as authorized by the state or other law, end quote. However, the HHS goes on to instruct that providers are required to limit the amount of protected health information, quote, to the minimum necessary to accomplish workers' compensation purposes, end quote. The HHS specifies that the minimum necessary criteria applies to limiting, quote, the amount of protected health information disclosed for payment purposes, end quote. Use caution when sending this form if you are not certain there is a reported workers' compensation claim. In particular, to protect the injured worker's privacy, be especially careful with medical treatment information, such as the information on DFR fields 18, 19, 20, 22, 23, and 24. Let's move on to the second circumstance requiring a report. According to the DWC guide, a primary treating physician must send a PR2 with their bill when Section 9785 of the California Code of Regulations requires a PR2. Now, this sentence by itself doesn't do us much good. So we turn to CCR Section 9785, Subdivision F, which lists the reporting duties of a primary treating physician. Sections 1 through 8 contain specific occurrences when the PTP shall issue a PR2 report. According to this regulation, a PR2 shall be sent within 20 days if any one of the first seven conditions occur, but no later than every 45 days from the last report of any type. Regulation 9785 allows a physician to submit the progress report on the PR2 form or allows the physician to submit a narrative report. For physicians choosing to use the PR2 form, they must use the 2015 version of the PR2 form. If you choose to use the narrative report, be sure to follow the detailed narrative PR2 instructions contained in Regulation 9785. First, the narrative report must be entitled Primary Treating Physician's Progress Report in bold-faced type. Second, the narrative report must indicate the reason for submitting the PR2 report. Specifically, the narrative report reason should indicate the particular occurrence that warranted the submission of the PR2. Third, the narrative report must contain the same information using the same subject headings in the same order as the form PR2. Regulation 9785 also allows the claims administrator and physician to mutually agree to make reports in any manner or form. 
For billing purposes, the PR2 report is billed using the California-specific code WC002. And the reimbursement for this report changes annually, but currently the reimbursement is $12.46. The third circumstance that requires a report is when an injured worker's condition is declared permanent and stationary. The PTP must issue the appropriate PNS report detailing any permanent disability or future medical care. And depending on the date of injury, the PNS report is submitted on either the PR3 or the PR4 form. For injuries which occurred before the year 2005, use the PR3 form. And for injuries which occurred in any year after 2004, use the PR4 form. Now, a physician can submit the permanent and stationary information differently as long as all the required information is listed on the PR3 or PR4 forms. For billing purposes, the PR3 is billed using the California-specific code WC003, and reimbursement is based on the number of pages in the report. In 2018, the reimbursement for the first page is $40.45, and the payment for each subsequent page is $24.88. Unless there's an agreement otherwise, the maximum fee for a PR3 report is $164.85 for six pages. To correctly bill for a PNS report, the units charged must reflect the number of pages in the PNS report. The PR4 is billed using the California-specific code WC004. Reimbursement is also based on the number of pages in the report. In 2018, reimbursement for the first page is $40.45, and the payment for each subsequent page is $24.88. Unless there's an agreement otherwise, the maximum fee for a PR4 report is $189.73 for seven pages. The fourth instance in which the DWC guide requires a report is when the bill is for evaluation and management service for a consultation. A narrative report must also be submitted. Now under the RBR view physician fee schedule, consultation reports are not reimbursable which means there's no separate payment for a consultation report. The RBR view physician fee schedule eliminated the previously used reporting CPT code 99080 with specific instructions not to use 99080. The RBR view physician fee schedule also eliminated the use of consultation CPT codes. And here's a list of consultation CPT codes, which are also on the do not use list. Instead, for all dates of service on or after January 1st, 2014, the physician fee schedule instructs doctors to code a consultation visit as a new patient evaluation and management service. For all office or outpatient consultations, the DWC directs providers to code these consultation services using the appropriate level E&M codes 99201 through 99205. There are three circumstances when a treatment report is separately reimbursable. The first circumstance is when the WCAB requests a consultation report. You bill the report with WC007, and add a modifier 32. The second circumstance is when the administrative director, who is George Parasoto, requests a report. You bill the report with WC007 and append a modifier 32. The third exception is when an AME or QME requests the consultation report. You bill the report with WC007 and a modifier 30. The reimbursement for WC007 with either modifier 32 or 30 is $40.45 for the first page and $24.88 for subsequent pages, with a maximum fee of $164.85 for six pages. 
respect to reporting requirements, the fifth instance is when a bill needs a re- when a bill needs a report is when it lists modifier 22, 23, or 25. Modifier 22 is appended to a CPT code where there is an unusual procedural service provided. When this modifier is used on a bill, a report is required to explain the unusual circumstances. Modifier 23 is for unusual anesthesia services and requires explanation in a report. Of course, use the modifier only with anesthesia CPTs. When modifier 25 is appended to an ENM CPT code, a report must address the reason for using this modifier. Modifier 25 is used when a physician performs a procedure on the same day as the ENM service. The next circumstance where the DWC requires a descriptive report is when the applicable fee schedule designates the CPT code's reimbursement is determined by report. The official medical fee schedule lists seven separate fee schedules, but the physician fee schedule contains most of the by report CPT codes. Regulation 9789.12.4 of the physician fee schedule provides instructions for billing and the reimbursement for these by report codes. When the CPT guide designates a procedure code as unlisted, These CPT codes are not assigned RVUs by Medicare, so the reimbursement for these codes is determined by report. The CPT guide includes all unlisted services and procedures. For an unlisted procedure code, the report should include pertinent information that describes the procedure, the need procedure, and quote, the time, effort, and equipment necessary to provide the service. End quote. With the RV RVU physician fee schedule, the DWC adopted Medicare status codes, but the DWC assigns each status code a workers' comp definition. Highlighted here are the status codes where the reimbursement is established by report. For example, when a procedure code is assigned a status code indicator of C, N, or R, or when a procedure code is not assigned any RVUs, the reimbursement is established by report. The report for these procedure codes should justify that the service was reasonable and necessary and must include the same pertinent information as the unlisted CPT codes. Since none of these by report codes are assigned a reimbursement value by the fee schedule, The regulation instructs that a value may be assigned based on a, quote, comparable procedure or analogous code, end quote. The comparable code should reflect a similar amount of resources, such as practice expense, time, complexity, expertise, etc. The use of the word may in this regulation indicates that other methods for determining the reimbursement may also apply. Now, there are two recommended ways to manage a by-report reimbursement. One is to justify the amount billed with a separate non-reimbursable report. And that report must have sufficient detail to support both the application of the procedure and the requested reimbursement. The second and more certain way to establish by-report reimbursement is to enter into a 5307.11 contract with the claims administrator. We've put together a sample by report contract that providers can use, which sets out the terms which need to be agreed upon. The email you receive after the webinar will have a link to download a sample contract. For more information on both methods, go to our blog. Just search the term by report and a few articles will appear, including the one you see on the screen. Now to the seventh report requirement, a report must be submitted with the bill when the fee schedule requires a report. We were unable to find an example in any of the seven fee schedules where a report is required by the fee schedule, but if any of you have encountered one, please let us know. We'd love to see it. Moving on, the next report requirement is for surgical procedures. You must send an operative note with both the facility billing and the professional billing for surgical procedures. 
All institutional bills and professional bills for surgery services or procedures must include an operative report. Next, you must send documentation of paid costs only when required by the applicable fee schedule or by a labor code statute. Let's start with Labor Code 5307.1, which requires documented paid costs under three circumstances. The first instance is if a physician dispenses a compound drug product. Proof of documented paid costs is required. Second, if a doctor dispenses a dangerous device, proof of documented paid costs is required. A dangerous device is defined in Business and Professional Code Section 4022. Statute 4022 sets out a dangerous device as a device that requires a physician prescription. The third instance when an invoice is required is when a physician dispenses pharmacy goods as defined by Labor Code Section 139.3. Labor Code Section 139.3 defines pharmacy goods as any medical foods and over-the-counter drugs. As a summary, the DWC only requires documentation of paid costs if the physician dispenses a compound drug, a dangerous device, or a pharmacy good. The documentation can be any one of the following, an invoice, proof of payment, or inventory records. For all dispensed DME, the DME fee schedule determines the reimbursement amount. If the patient can obtain the device without a prescription, an invoice is not required for reimbursement. A carrier cannot require an invoice for durable medical equipment as long as there is a fee schedule amount associated with the code. The only exception is the DME products meets the definition of a dangerous device as defined by California Business and Professional Codes, Section 4022. Moving on, the tenth circumstance for a report is when the claims administrator reasonably requests the information before the submission of the billing. The 11th documentation requirement instructs providers to submit any evidence of authorization received from the claims administrator. And here's the 12th and final document requirement. For services not provided by the primary treating physician, a prescription or referral should accompany the bill. The DWC does not require a pharmacy to submit the prescription with pharmacy bills. So that's it for the 12 types of supporting documentation that the DWC expects for a complete bill. To review what we covered in this webinar, a complete bill consists of four parts. First, you must use the correct form. Second, you must use correct billing codes. Third, you must correctly fill out the form. Fourth, you must send the required reports or supporting documents with the bill. And that's it. Now the next webinar in our 101 series is about payments and EORs. We'll cover how to interpret EORs as well as the claims administrator's responsibilities when responding to workers' comp bills. When you register, don't forget to ask us questions about EORs and payment. And after today's webinar ends, a survey will appear. We sincerely appreciate you taking 30 seconds to answer some brief questions. And as we stated before, later this week, you'll receive an email with links to watch a video recording of the webinar, as well as links to download the slides, a sample 5307.11 contract, and the patient intake form. Let's turn to the questions. First, I'll answer some of the registration questions, and then if we have time, I'll answer some of the questions that came in during the webinar. The first two questions are about 99358. First from Cheryl, are we allowed to continue to bill for record review? And if so, is 99358 still valid? And the second question from Denise, one of our largest amount of work comp denials is justifying our 99358s. So the short answer to this is yes, providers are allowed to once again bill for 99358 for record review. And here's a chart and a table which break down the tricky time interval part of 99358 and 99359. 
The long answer is quite long, and we get tons of questions about 99358 and 99359 because it's been so confusing. We also have over 10 blog posts about these codes. And the answer is so long that last year we gave a whole webinar about it, which you can find in our webinar library. And in 2019, we'll host another webinar to address these codes and answer questions you have. The next question is from Nadia. Where can I get a copy of the medical treatment utilization schedule? You can find information on California's medical treatment utilization schedule, or MTUS, on this Department of Industrial Relations webpage. It directs you to 37 pages of regulations as well as to the treatment guidelines developed by the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, or ACOM. These guidelines have been adopted into the MTUS and access to them is purchased through a subscription. The DWC webpage has directions on how to do so. Our next question is from Nick. Are there times when I do not need to use a CMS 1500 form and can use my own billing form? No. You cannot use your own bill form. The DWC guide lists the required billing forms. And healthcare providers must use the CMS 1500 for paper billing. The next question is from Sean. Our facilities often place the claim number in box 11 and box 11B of the 1500 form. But as I understand, the claim number should be in box 11B only, and, 11, and box 11 is for the policy number. That is correct. Box 11 is for the employer's insurance policy number. However, it's not a required field. And here's our last registration question that I'll answer. Is there any penalty if the provider fails to timely submit the PR2 within the 20 or 45 days? There are no penalties in the labor code or the regulations if a provider fails to timely submit the PR2. So now I'll go on to some questions that you sent in today. I'm going to try and limit the questions, the topics to the, that, uh, to the material that we covered today. And while I'm answering questions, I will have my contact information on the screen. You're welcome to reach out to me directly, and we really mean that. Please do reach out to us with any questions that you have. So let's take a look at some of the questions that have come in today. First question is, can you provide the definition of original bill? Where is this found in the labor code and or regulations? Uh, original bill is the DWC term that's used throughout the DWC guide. So that's where we get that term. Next question is, for social security number, what if only the last four digits was provided? How should we enter it in the form? So we showed you today that the entire social security number is required. There aren't any allowances for just the last four digits. So make sure to be asking for that. Make sure to explain to injured workers that it is required in order for your bills to be submitted. So you do need to include the entire social security number, not just the last four digits. Next question is, how about self-insured companies? Do they have to follow the billing cycle? Yes, all employers must follow the rules, even if they're self-insured. And if an employer purchases workers' comp insurance, that insurance must follow the rules. So there aren't any exceptions there. Next, if using a DBA, does this need to be noted in box 33 of the HICFA to show the MPN? So MPNs are really related to providers. That's where they're called medical provider networks. Um, they're lists of providers. They're not based on the company. So for MPNs, the rendering or supervising providers, NPI, is usually what's referenced. That's up in box 24. doesn't have anything to do with what's in box 33. Our next question is, what if the bill was sent timely, but to the incorrect insurance company or address, but the mistake wasn't caught until after 12 months? So according to the Labor Code for Timely Filing, the DWC is instructed to provide some regulations that list exceptions for timely filing, but to date, the DWC hasn't issued any exceptions. So at this time, there are no instructions for that scenario that you've described here. Next question is, there are instances when the bill is rejected due to the bill review error. It is submitted multiple times, then when it is miraculously accepted and processed, it falls into the untimely submission. 
How can we send proof to the adjuster or bill review that the original bill was submitted on a timely basis but was rejected erroneously? So this really depends on what system you use, and I can't tell how your system is set up, but in our system, in Daisy Bill, you can use the bill history as the proof of submission. And further, this is just a warning. If you are using a single clearinghouse or even two clearinghouses, and that clearinghouse or those clearinghouses are not the chosen clearinghouse for the payer that you're sending a bill to, you are out of luck. That's not compliant submission. So for proof of timely submission, you must submit directly to the clearinghouse that the carrier has hired. If you have questions about that, I know it's tricky. Please reach out to me. This is a very, very important part of e-billing is correct routing and submitting to the correct clearinghouse. So reach out to me so we can talk about that. Next, can supplemental report for reversal of denial of an RFA, can we use WC007? This is a very important question, and the answer is absolutely not. We see providers misuse these WC007 codes all the time. You must use either the modifier 30 or the modifier 32 to distinguish under which circumstance a consultation code is appropriate, um, or report code, I should say. Um, it's, it's not to be used as a workaround for submitting supplemental reports. So do not use that code for those purposes. Next, are PR reports subject to reduction or to be paid in full? So reduced payments for PR2 reports are determined by the network and PPO discount contract that you sign. So you'd need to review your contract that's referenced on the EOR. Anytime a network is utilized to reduce a bill, it should be listed on the EOR. You should cross-reference with that contract that you've signed and see exactly what um, reimbursement you're entitled to. How do I calculate payment for the UBO4 when box 44 for the HICPIC code is blank? What I think is you're asking is why aren't revenue codes used on the UBO4 for ASC and hospital outpatient billing? And the reason is that OMFS reimbursements are calculated using the Medicare Hospital Outpatient Perspective Payment System. It's also known as HOPPS. And the HOPPS uses CPT codes to calculate reimbursements, not revenue codes. So those HICPIC codes, those CPT codes, are required to be on the, the facility bill because that's how the surgery reimbursement is, um, is calculated. Will a bill be automatically denied if the claim is not entered or if we enter unknown? You must have either the claim number or the word unknown. You can't leave it blank. So yes, you can potentially be rejected or denied if you don't include one of those um, uh, entries on the field, either unknown or the claim number. The PR2 is in addition to the E&M service. So I think this is just a comment. Yes, that is correct. There are two payments. One is for the medical service and one is for the report. Next question is, how do we get the California fee schedule on the website? Um, there is no published California fee schedule in terms of a list with codes and reimbursement values. You have to either calculate it yourself or utilize a source that calculates it for you. One of those sources is our Daisy Bill Wizard, which includes the OMFS calculator. So that is one way that you can get the reimbursement amounts. A few more questions here. Next one is, are medical legal reports required to be billed on the HICFA 1500. So there are no billing rules for submitting bills for medical legal bills. And without regulations, you can send your bill on a napkin via carrier pigeon if you wanted. Um, there are rules for submitting second review appeals for med legal bills. Um, so, so make sure that you follow those. They must be done on the form. And we have information about that in one of our webinars. Next is how do I know what drugs, injections, and DMEs are covered? So you can use the DME POS fee schedule for durable medical goods. For injectable drugs, you use the Medi-Cal rates file, which is updated monthly. For pharmaceuticals, you use a different Medi-Cal rates file, which is updated weekly. And then for all of these, as I mentioned before, you can use the Daisy Bill Wizard, um, the OMFS calculator, because we do calculate all of those. So you can enter the codes and see what is reimbursed for every date of service. Next, can we charge for having to send our bill to the carrier or insurance company for payment after the first time? Unfortunately, no, you can't, but we think that's a great idea. You shouldn't have to be sending your bills multiple times. Next, how many days do you have once you receive a denial to respond to the carrier or insurance company? Um, so I think what you're asking is an appeal, and you must submit an appeal, which is called a second review, within 90 days of receipt of the EOR. 
I know a lot of people think that sounds like a lot of time, but it really goes quickly. You need to make sure to send that within 90 days. Otherwise, you are not entitled to any additional payment. Let's do two more questions. The next one is, are implant invoices required when billing for implants? No, because there is no separate reimbursement for implants. So, no. And our last question. In order to use Modifier 30 for a QME or AME request for a consult, is it enough if in the body of the QME or AME report the consult is being requested, or is there a specific request that needs to be done directly from the QME or AME? It should be enough just to use the modifier and have proof the report references the consultation for the AME or QME. You do not need any other prior authorization. The only warning here is that the report cannot duplicate information that was already sent to the AME or the QME. So just make sure that referral source is trustworthy and that the, um, the medical legal provider did not already receive the information that they're requesting. Okay, that's it for today. I know that was a lot of information. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. If you do have other questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me. My contact information is on the screen. Give me a call, my direct number, send me an email. We're here to help and make sure to sign up for our next webinar. Thanks so much and have a great day.